A millennial walks into a bar and an interesting random conversation takes place regarding entitlement, capitalism, and whether or not success is limited to just a few. Has an entire generation been excluded from the potential of success? That's what we're covering in today's show. Hey, hey, Wealth Warrior. Welcome to the Street Smart Wealth Experience. I'm Jackie Almer, and this is the show that empowers you to create the business and the lifestyle of your dreams and live a fulfilled, wealthy life in every sense of the word. I founded StreetSmartWealth.com and created the Street Smart Wealth Academy to assist mostly network marketers in developing the skills and the mindset to pay the bills. And you'll find these show notes over on my blog at StreetSmartWealth.com. You can also join me in my Facebook group, StreetSmartWealthSchool.com. All right, so I had a really random conversation yesterday when my husband and I ventured out in the afternoon just to have a glass of wine for me and a cold beer for him in one of our favorite little coffee shops as we were out essentially supporting small local businesses in our area. And yes, we were properly social distancing. So we end up in this coffee shop and we're just talking and I'm sharing uh, an interesting tweet that I had been forwarded by some of my airline friends. And when I researched the person who had sent the tweet originally, um, she's an Australian journalist who I really like a lot of what she shares, but she had shared an interesting statistic that 26, I believe it was 26.7% increase has been noted of those in basically essentially in Australia in their 20s you know 20s to early 30s that that age group of showing up at medical mental health clinics and facilities with an increase and a fear of doing self-harm essentially inflicting some type of damage to themselves from suicide to cutting to you know rampant drug abuse different things like that And it's been attributed by these youth who are showing up to COVID-19 and social isolation that many of them are experiencing that, you know, working from home, being unable to attend church, being unable to attend live um, drug and rehab type treatment, just all of that type thing. And, And I was saying to my husband that I don't understand I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but I don't understand an overall feeling of hopelessness. And that's what many of them were citing as they just felt hopeless. And I was saying to him in all my years on the earth, which is, you know, many, I'm in my fifties, so many decades, I have never felt hopeless. I've never felt like there was no other option for me. And I've never felt like I couldn't improve my situation if I just worked at it you know, if I just worked at it. And I don't know where that came from for me, but he was in total agreement that he felt the same way. And so we were having this conversation. And again, I'm not suggesting it's not a real thing. My whole commentary was just around the fact that in all my life, I've never felt that way. So I didn't understand, like I couldn't personally relate to having that feeling, but I'm not negating that it exists. Certainly it does. These, you know, these, these young adults aren't showing up out of nowhere, just making stuff up. So we were talking about that and about that time, a young man who was sitting by himself across the bar from us said, excuse me, did I hear you talking about the hopelessness that the millennials in my generation is feeling? And I said, yeah. And we kind of started talking about it and, and I shared a little bit of the story again. And, and he said, can I share with you why my generation feels hopeless? And I said, absolutely, are you kidding? And he just started telling me how he felt like he himself and many of his friends and so many people in that generation, they feel like they did all the things right that they were told to do. They went to college, they racked up $100,000 or more in college debt, and now they've come out without jobs really, without the promise of a future, the housing market is crazy. Um, You know, he just went down this whole list of things that they were feeling hopeless about. And he brought up the concept of capitalism and he said i'm not necessarily saying it's bad but there are a lot of us who feel like we've been taken advantage of with capitalism and all that's gone on with that and 
you know, one thing, we, we were having a very civil conversation. I really approached it from um, an empathetic listening point of view because I'm interested in hearing. I, I finally asked him how old he is, and he's 30. Um, and so we just started talking about different things like choosing to go to a four-year college and incur $100,000 in college debt. I mean, that's certainly a choice. And, and that's what I'm really all about, honestly. I'm really all about choice and owning the choices that we make, whatever those are. Now, I have one child who attended a semester of college and then went to a fire academy and is now serving in the U.S. Marine Corps, and it's perfect for him. College was not the best option for him. He knew it. I didn't want to agree with that. But looking back, it's like, you know what? I don't get to decide what's best for him. My daughter did attend a four-year college. She got done in four years, no summer school, no messing around, made the dean's list, did a great job. And that's what we told her. We were like, you have four years. Anything else beyond that is on you. We're willing to pay. And, and of course, we had put money aside and, and we're, we're totally prepared to pay for her college education. And we did. But we had certainly rules and restrictions and we stuck to those and she honored it and, and got it done. Um, so it's interesting, you know, we started talking about then entitlement and capitalism and, you know, what it, what it really means and where we would be if we didn't have capitalism, like the very locally owned small coffee shop that we were sitting and enjoying time chatting and enjoying, you know, food and drink wouldn't exist without capitalism. I mean, those are some of the things that capitalism provides. It provides the opportunity for those who are willing to venture out of the norm and take some risks and profit from that when all goes well. Now, certainly there are some negativities involving capitalism for those who get greedy and don't remember, quote unquote, the little people. And I don't mean little people in a negative way, but the people that really help contribute to the wealth and, and abundance of a company by being good employees and, you know, carrying out the mission of the company and all and all like that. And being from the airline industry, I've certainly experienced plenty of both sides of that, plenty of sacrificing and taking pay cuts and giving for the good of the company to keep the company in business and then the next year watching the whole executive team and board of directors and all the you know top management get millions and millions of dollars in bonuses for a job well done while we were still living under pay cuts and uh you know slashed hours and a lot of different things that go along with that so i certainly can see that it can be a double-edged sword when it's not Treat, treated appropriately, not respected by everyone, but to just say that across the board capitalism is bad, well, I'm guessing you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you really believed that because you're probably listening because you have a side hustle business, you're a network marketer, you're a real estate agent hanging your own shingle, you understand the power in your own ability to make the choices and put in the work and the ethic to move yourself forward. So it was interesting, you know, we, we, we got around to the conversation about entitlement and, and we agreed. I told him that I wasn't saying entitled, I wasn't putting that all on that generation, that myself personally was willing to take responsibility for ways that we've raised our children to feel entitled, whether it's, you know, one of the things that I've shared is that my children both grew up with a cleaning lady. And for the longest time, I couldn't get my daughter to pick her wet towels up off the floor. Um, and that was a bit of entitlement, I think. You know, I, I had to clean my own room. I helped clean the house. I didn't grow up with the cleaning lady. I grew up learning that work ethic and all of that. And I'm certainly not um, trying to be negative toward my daughter because she has a great work ethic. And now, I mean, she's grown into a lot of things, realizing that as you age and become an adult, you have to you have to carry your own weight. And that's an important thing to remember. And again, it's not suggesting that this kid isn't. But the more we started talking about it, I finally asked him what he what his degree was in. And it's in fine art. He's a he's an oil painter, you know, and canvases and that type thing. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if you're going to go into a profession like that, if you really want to follow your passion, which I'm certainly all about, you have to understand and do the research of what the potential livelihood is of a career like that. And ideally, when you're going into a career like that, you have a more solid plan A to sustain and support yourself while you're building that plan B, because that's just the reality of the world that we live in 
and art. And I'm not suggesting that it should be that way. I'm just suggesting that it is that way. And you've got to be willing to be the bootstrapper, to get out there, to market yourself, to develop the skills, whether it's in sales or marketing or, um, you know, just really self-promotion to get yourself out there. And especially in the world of social media, I, I just really believe that you have to be willing always to, to be the one that takes, that gives 100% until you reach a point where you know, the universe, if you will, starts giving back to you. The thought that you can just be super passionate about something and go pursue it blindly and have it provide for you just very often is not the case. Even even with a business degree, you've still got to go out and find a job and, you know, do a lot of those type things. And I say business degree is a more um, economically recognized field of study. I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting it's the best or the right. I'm just suggesting that with a business degree, you have a wide open range of options in terms of employment that you can apply for, starting your own business, those type things. So I asked him some additional questions too, including if he believed that if anyone could do what he wanted to do, would it not also be possible for him? Because that's me. All my life, I mean, I, I can look back on my own expertise and story of coming up in the world, making the decision, the choice not to complete my college education, which in making that choice, especially back in the 80s, was checking the box of a lot of choices that that was making for me without me really thinking about it. It was automatically excluding me from even the potential of applying for certain jobs, much less getting hired, because without that piece of paper, nobody would even take a look at me. But it's a choice I made, I knew it going in, and I also knew that I wasn't going to sit around and resign myself to, well, this is my only lot in life is to do X, Y, and Z because I don't have this piece of paper. I knew that there were other success stories of people who hadn't gone to college, who'd gone on to create what they wanted. And I was much more interested in constantly looking forward and working to move and shift myself forward to attain what I wanted to attain and bust through those glass ceilings, because also as a female, one might want to say I was limited by that too. But I've never chosen to see myself as limited, as prohibited, um, as marginalized, whatever, uh, because of those things. Because again, if one person can make it happen, anyone can make it happen. And you know, some for, certainly from the female perspective, some things that come to mind are um, some people that come to mind are Oprah Winfrey born um, to a, an unmarried couple who were sharecroppers um, you know uh, sexually abused by a relative for years growing up in the south a, as a black person I mean a, a lot of different things that that one could say operated against her but she's a classic example of one of if not the most powerful woman on the planet um, and she managed to do it and if you've ever read her story she ran into lots of roadblocks she ran into lots of people telling her that she couldn't do it because she was black that she couldn't do it because she was a woman that she couldn't do it because she was from the south because she couldn't do it because she wasn't the perfect size you know there were a lot of things and that that weighed against her in terms of what one might think it would take to be successful and yet she just refused to stop. She just kept pushing and refused to let those marginalizations or negative things, potentially negative things, stop her from moving forward. Uh, Sarah Blakely, who uh, is the founder of Spanx, the, you know, the, the women's hosiery line, for lack of a better word, pants, leggings, and intimate apparel to slim one down without some of the negativity that's gone on with other undergarments. You know, she is another great example. She had a lot of things working against her. And, you know, she developed this business plan from her kitchen table, testing and trying different things, marching it out there, marketing it to people, being told no over and over again until she finally found someone who said yes. And she had $5,000 of her own that she invested into her endeavor. And the list goes on. J.K. Rowling, who wrote, you know, the Harry Potter series, Michael Dell of Dell Computers, who basically quit college and started developing, you know, computer parts and computer systems and stuff out of his college dorm. Um, and then another one who comes to mind, because I, again, I'm talking to this kid and I'm asking him, you know, do you have any mentors? Do you have anyone you follow who 
is basically, you know, of your same age group or whatever, who's been the success, develop the kind of success that you want. And he said, well, I know, can you give me some names? Well, honestly, I wasn't expecting this random conversation. So I couldn't right off the top of my head, I couldn't come up with anything, especially in his age range, I could come up with um, Russell Brunson came to mind in terms of an internet marketer who, you know, went to school and was a wrestler and at the same time was building his ideas in his college dorm. He's a little bit older than this kid. He's a decade or so. I think Russell's in his 40s. Anyway, but point being, he wasn't when he started this. And the person who came to mind was a guy that most of you probably won't even have heard of. His name is Mike Johnston. He was with the band Simon Says, and he's a drummer. And you can Google Simon Says if you don't remember them. They were kind of a kind of a semi-metal band, uh, 80s and 90s, I think more than 90s. And he was the drummer, and they, they had reached the point where they were making it. Like, they, they had made it. They had done an album. They were about to do another one. They were out on tour, opening in big arenas. And he just looked out across his drum set out at the crowd in this huge arena somewhere in Europe and said to himself, this is not the life I want. I don't do drugs. I don't want to be in this lifestyle. I don't really like being in front of big crowds. I don't, I I love music and I love playing drums and I'm passionate about that, but I'm not passionate about this and I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this. And he basically quit the band that night with the, with the record deal on the table I don't think it was called a record deal back then, but hopefully you know what I mean, a CD deal. I don't know. Um, But he walked and he moved back to the somewhere near the Bay Area, I think, and moved in with his girlfriend and tried to figure himself out. He knew he wanted to do music. He was still passionate about that, but he was really trying to figure out a way to pay the bills and, you know, make a livelihood in in the in the field that he loves Um, but not have to sacrifice his soul, which is what he felt like he was doing to be out on tour. And he ultimately started shooting little videos and started selling drum lessons for 99 cents a piece. You can Google him. You can find him on YouTube. My husband's a drummer. I actually turned my husband on to him after hearing him on a podcast. And my husband's bought a few of his lessons before. So it's kind of funny. And he's built a multi, multi multi-million dollar enterprise selling 99 cent drum lessons to kids who wanted to learn to play the drums. And he's got a fascinating story. He's been interviewed on a lot of podcasts. But I'm telling this kid about him and he goes, oh, but his goal was to make money. And I said, no, or to get rich, I think he said. His goal was to get rich. And I said, no, I, I, I don't think that was his goal. I think his goal was, just as I had said, his goal was to figure out how to use his passion and what he loved doing, drumming, to make a living for himself, to support himself. I don't ever remember hearing him say to make the kind of money that I could if I stayed in the celebrity realm and, you know, stayed touring with the band and did big sold out arenas and, and, you know, record deals and all like that. I've never heard him say that. He just wanted to figure out how to pay the bills, like how to, you know, stop quote unquote mooching off his girlfriend and, you know, meet her halfway or whatever and, and, and pay for his own way. And that's what I said to this kid. I, I don't ever remember him saying he wanted to get rich. Did he? Yes, he did. But he did it on his terms. He did it following his dream and his passion. So that was kind of my my whole point to this kid was, if anybody's ever done it, you can too. You're way too young to resign yourself to the fact that your entire generation has been cut out of the ability to be successful. Because success is not just limited to a few people. It's limited to a few in the eyes of some, mostly those who aren't willing to truly develop what I call are the three C's, the clarity around what it is they do and how they're going to do it and who who their ideal target audience is, the commitment to figuring it out, and the consistency that it takes to put yourself out there over and over and over again in whatever way that's going to be until you achieve the success that you want. Our choices are what determine our success, really and truly. And and I really do stand behind this. If any one person has ever done what it is that you or I strive to do, then we can do it too. Can you do it following your passion? Well, if you can, again, if you can find any one person who's ever done that, then you certainly can do that too. And speaking of Oprah Winfrey, in her book, The Path Made Clear, 
on page 110, she has a quote by Bishop T.D. Jakes, and he basically says, Surrounding yourself with people you want to be like takes you to the next level because they are modeling the lifestyle that you're stepping into rather than emulating the lifestyle you are stepping away from. Putting yourself in environments with people who are positive or doing what you're doing, whether it's starting a business, owning a company, managing a division, you need to run with people who have your current and who are in your flow. And if you see that, you get it. And I couldn't agree with them more. I would love your thoughts and feedback. Um, feel, free, feel free to tweet them at me, at Jackie Elmer. Share them in the Facebook group, streetsmartwellschool.com. Or leave a comment below if there is such a space. Until next time, remember this, hesitation never cashed a check. Good luck to you in your business. If you would like even more tips and training, I have a free gift for you over at streetsmartwealth.me. It's my guide, Unleash the Power of Social Selling. If you're ready to stop struggling in your business and develop a sales and social media strategy to attract your ideal clients, team partners, and create the success you dream about, grab the guide right now over at streetsmartwealth.me. You'll find more on my blog at streetsmartwealth.com as well as my Facebook group, streetsmartwealthschool.com, and follow me on Instagram at Jackie Elmer. And make sure you learn more about the Street Smart Wealth Academy over at streetsmartwealthacademy.com. I'll see you on the next show.